Well, Happy New Year to everyone. It's really wonderful to be here today. I've been aching to preach here for a while. That gives you a little glimpse at my sense of humor. Maybe all you want is a glimpse after that. I don't know. But uh, my name is John. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, I know some of the faces in here. I know Chris, and uh, you're so lucky to have him as your pastor. And no, he didn't pay me to say that. Um, no, but he, it's such a pleasure uh, to see his familiar face here. I also um, know some of you from um, uh, being at Trout, some of you youth. Um, and I also recognize some of you from walking around at the fall retreat, but I don't know who you are. So hopefully that's not weird, but we see so many people and... Um, it is just so fun to just see God bringing people together from across the state um, to worship him and to uh, have fun. And um, I, I just feel really blessed to be at Trout. So um, I have had kind of a cool journey at Trout. Um, my first time there, uh, I actually did not grow up going to church camp. I went to Boy Scout camp and, um, you know... Uh, I would get, we'd sleep in tents, and uh, it rained all week, and we would go hang up our sleeping bags to dry, and then it would rain, and so we'd run out of the tent, grab the sleeping bag, put it back inside, and, um, but strangely enough, I went back the next year, so, (laughs) Um, but at Trout, um, I, uh, this is my third time working there. I was also a pastor in Long Prairie, Minnesota, which is where our bulletins today come from, from Cathedral Press, so it's kind of neat to see that. Um, but what I'm doing right now is I work with uh, our interns, and our interns are a really important part of our ministry. Um, and some of you you youth um, might recognize um, this when I say it. They're the ones who help make the slime that you uh, got to slime each other with. Um, they're the ones who uh, set up the games and they uh, run the zip line and do all sorts of things like that. So we, uh, it's a really cool opportunity to work with some really stellar um, college-age uh, kids who've decided to spend a year serving God. And um, I also do some other things, but um, paint horse troughs, make ice for broom ball courts, uh, all sorts of crazy things. Um, but uh, a little update on Trout. Some really cool things are happening there. And um, we're building a camp called Wild Woods. And it is going to be this really, really cool themed world for uh, kids in first through third grade to go to. Um, so we've built a castle if you'll believe it. We've built um, some tree houses for them to stay in as cabins. And they are currently building this dining hall called the Spork, which is called a Spork because that's all that is going to be there um, as utensils. So if you can't use a Spork to eat it, it's not going to be served. So, <laughs> um, so the Spork is a really cool place. And um, I, I love being at Trout because no two days are the same. Uh, one of my uh, weeks there um, this fall was spent helping this guy named Doug Carlson um, set up this 30-foot fireplace. And uh, I, I didn't get to do anything too cool. I was just mixing mortar and um, for, the, for the bricks and the cement and everything and then passing him bricks. But, man, did I get a workout that week. Um, this gentleman is, uh, you know, much older than me, and he was moving way faster, so it was it was pretty cool. Um, but one of the things that I think is so special about Trout is that it is a place where anyone can serve. Um, most of our camp has been built by men uh, who are retired, and it's it's just amazing to see um, uh, just how much has been done by volunteers. Um, we also have um, we have several retreats um, uh, called Serve Team, which you can call and ask more about. But basically, retired men and women come and do all these projects to get us ready for the summer. 
And it's because of uh, their work that we're able to keep offering these great camps for kids and also year-round programming. Um, uh, we also, uh, you know, it's just a place for everybody. Um, we're not just a kids' camp. We're also a place where anyone can serve. So if you have any questions or want to learn more, you can ask me or just call up Trout and ask the friendly staff there how you can help. We also have a lot of fun stuff going on, too, like men's and women's retreat. And uh, that's in September when it's just beautiful, not too hot. Um, and it's just a really, really fun time. Uh, we have this amazing steak dinner for the guys and a really fancy dinner for the, gir the ladies. And uh, so just a really special place. Uh, if you can't tell, I'm pretty biased about it. So, um, so yes, uh, I would like to invite you guys to open up your Bibles this morning. To John chapter 4, verses 46 through 54. And we're going to, as we're turning there, I'm just going to set us up here. Um, this is early in the book of John. And um, Jesus has, this is at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And we've seen him do some pretty amazing things so far. We've seen him turn the water into wine as his first great... Uh, what John calls a sign. It's not just a miracle. It, there's a meaning behind it. Uh, we also see in this um, Jesus talking with a Samaritan woman. And he's talking to her about how you know, he asks her for a drink of water and she gives it to him. She's really surprised that uh, a Jew would be talking to her, a Samaritan. And he says, if you knew who is you know, talking to you, you'd ask for living water and I'd give it to you. That's my paraphrase there. Um, and so we've seen Jesus do some pretty amazing um, things so far. And this next thing that we're going to see him do, I think, is really meaningful, especially as we start a new year. So please pray with me and, and uh, we'll go to God's word. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful um, beautiful prospect of a, a brand new year, Lord. And um, I pray that as we look ahead, that your promises would be uh, before our eyes, that we would just know that we are held in your hand, God, and uh, that you love us so much. And so as we, as we start a new year, Lord, I pray that you would help us to bring all of our, um, everything to your throne, uh, to find grace. Um, Lord, all of our, our hurts and aches, all of our, um, regrets. Um, Lord, I pray that uh, all of our joys, uh, just everything, Lord, that we have, we offer to you. Um, and to, to just give it to Christ, to be transformed um, by, by your grace and your power, Lord. Uh, we know that you are a God who raises the dead. You are a God who, who heals. Uh, you are just an amazing, you are the most amazing um, one that we can know and worship. And so we just love you so much, Father. We, we thank you so much for your son who you gave to us. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would accomplish everything that you have in your word to accomplish here today. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, John 4. 46 through 54. So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. 
and he himself believed in all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. Well, like Snowy Field, the new year is a beautiful, unbroken canvas waiting to be filled in. But just as it is new, it is also unknown. It kind of is like that, that first step onto the ice of, of the season. You know, you, you kind of you kinda know that it's ready, but you're not quite sure if you, how much weight you can put on it yet. Well, the question I think for all of us is, will we proceed in faith or in fear? As we open the pages of Scripture, we will see that Jesus calls us to trust him when we can't see. It's just like that, that step onto the ice. We know it'll hold us, but we're not quite sure if we can put our full weight on us. And Jesus is calling to us to trust him when we can't quite see what's ahead. But we like to see, <laughs> don't we? I like to see. So often we expect to see and we struggle when we can't. Maybe some of you today are waiting for answers. Maybe some of you are afraid. Maybe some of you are eager for a new start, but you're not quite sure what to expect. And maybe you're a little afraid to expect anything at all. Well, God's word gives us hope today that if we can see Jesus with eyes of faith, we can see enough. Jesus calls me, he calls you to believe him when we can't see. For when we do, we remember the, what Paul says in Ephesians, the hope to which he called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe? According to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Amen. So we turn to John 4.46 to remember that great power where Jesus has returned to Cana where he had made the water wine. So he came again to Cana in Galilee where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son for he was at the point of death. Cana was where Jesus had first demonstrated his power. It's where he had made this reputation uh, that sent this man from Capernaum ha hastening to find Jesus before it was too late. This miracle had given people this glimpse of what was possible. It had demonstrated Jesus' power and authority by turning water into wine. And word of this had assuredly gone out. Now when this official heard that Jesus was nearby, he knew his son had a chance. I would like to ask you to cast your memory back to answered prayers. To cast your memory back to, to, to great deliverance that God has done. Things in the past that give us hope to look forward to the future. This official had seen this glimpse of, of God do this amazing thing. And so when he was in need, he remembered that and, and ran to Cana as fast as he could. This summer at Trout, we saw God deliver us from several terrible storms. And you guys are close enough nearby where I don't have to tell you too much about that. But in probably the worst one, um, uh, we were all asleep in our cabins. And we woke up the next morning to find several hundred, uh, somewhere between 300 to 500 trees knocked over by a tornado the night before. And yet... There was not uh, any hurt to any camper of the several hundred campers we had on grounds. And there was no major damage um, at all. Uh, it was just absolutely amazing. We just were walking around knowing that the hand of God had protected us. I mean, it was even crazy because 
um, we saw all these places where there would be a building and four trees and there would be a tree down here, a tree down here, a tree down here, <laughs> a tree down the other way. Um, there is another uh, in the trailer park where our, our volunteers stayed. I just love this so much. There is this little trailer and a little tiny Weber grill standing upright. And there was a tree down a few feet past the Weber grill, like this way. <laughs> and then another one on this end. So two trees fell uh, feet away from this trailer. And it, we were just like, God, like, we are just blown away. <sighs> but we weren't blown away. Um, and that's why we were thankful. <laughs> so I think of that. And I think, wow, God, you were able to deliver to an amazing extent. We serve a mighty and a merciful God. And yet, in moments of testing, um, when it gets hard to see again, that's when we have to remember clearest what God has shown us in the past. Because we can't see the future. Um, we, uh, but we can see the past. And we re when we remember that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that he doesn't change, and we, we remind ourselves that God is able to do mighty things, that uh, just because we can't see him, it doesn't mean that God can't be just the same God he's always been. Um, when we remember that, that's when we can look to the future with great hope. Well, what is your Cana? What memory will stir you to hope in God's power and your present need? Jesus had performed this amazing miracle that showed uh, what he could do. And that's what gave this man hope um, when his son was ill. What is your Cana? Verse 48. So Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Now, you who are parents can best imagine the anguish, anxiety, and urgency in this man's voice. And it might lead us to wonder, why now would Jesus say this? Why is there suddenly this discussion on faith when, when this man just wants Jesus to come and heal his son? Well, there, there's something here in this tension for us that's just absolutely amazing, that just blows me away. This man would be willing to do anything to save his boy, just like any of you who are parents would be willing to do anything for your children and grandchildren. So in this moment of fear, he hears Jesus challenging words. Will he believe even if he can't see? Often in moments of trial, Christ's words pierce to the heart of the matter. Just get right down to the nub. Cuts out all of the just all of the back chatter. They clarify that our relationship with him is based on faith. God has compassion on our fear, but he listens to our faith. Now Jesus knew this man's great need, but it did not eclipse the man's need for saving faith in Jesus. And many people saw Jesus perform miracles, but didn't get anything out of it. Isn't that just astounding? But we know this is true from Scripture. Jesus did so many miracles. And when he walked into Jerusalem for his Passion Week, there were probably thousands upon thousands of people who had seen him do great things, and yet they ended up yelling, crucify him. So this man was asking Jesus for a miracle, but Jesus wanted to give him something even greater. Did this man just want to see a miracle? Or did he really trust Jesus to heal his boy without walking back to Capernaum? You see, sometimes we get in this mindset, and I see this happening in myself all the time, where we see God's path of deliverance in only one way. This man thought, Jesus can heal my boy, but in order to do so, we have to get back to Capernaum stat. You know, let's not stand around here talking about faith. Let's just start walking back. But we, we get in this mindset where we think that 
that God's path of deliverance is limited as far as we can see what he can do. And that's when Jesus turns the tables on it because he says, do you, do you believe that I can heal him? Even if I don't show you anything cool? And this man had to decide right then and there what he really believed. You see, God isn't limited uh, by the boxes that we put him in sometimes about what he can and can't do. And, and sometimes we, we just start to panic when we think, oh, you know, this is the only way I see it happening. But that's when God is asking, do you trust me even if you can't see me do it? Well, if this man was truly willing to do anything, was he willing to do nothing? <laughs> was he willing to walk back to Capernaum just believing that Jesus had healed his boy without seeing? Now, today we live in a world where, you know, um, you can, you know, FaceTime somebody <laughs> in another town and kind of see what's going on, not... Not very well all the time, but the, the poignancy of this story is in the fact that this man had to just turn around and start walking back and he couldn't know what was going to happen. He just had to believe Jesus' word. And so as he walked back, he was just walking back with just the knowledge that Jesus said that his boy would live. And that was enough. And he just kept walking back. In the same way, Jesus talks to us. Are we willing to believe him or must we see? I have a dear friend who recently has been going through a time of testing in his faith. And he uh, has been just... Uh, spending time around people who've been really challenging his faith uh, and, and it has just been this really, this time of testing. And he said to me, John, uh, I've basically come to this place where, you know, people, some people over here are telling me some things and other people are over here are telling me other things, but I just feel like it's just, I'm just alone and it's just me and God. And I just have to trust him. And I, was, I just got up and I gave him a big hug and I said, Jesse, that's the best place in the world to be because when it comes down to it, you have touched the rock-solid foundation of faith that you can just trust God. Verse 49, the official said to him, Son, sir, come down before my child dies. This father is desire for his son to live is strong but he still thinks jesus must walk to capernaum in order to heal the boy so it is with us we often feel frustrated because we have these good desires we want these good things that are god honoring but we we think god is stuck in a box and how he will answer our prayers maybe it's a bill that we don't know how it's going to get paid maybe it's a family member who we don't know how they're going to get healed. Maybe it's a question that's just nagging at us that we don't know how to answer. But sometimes we get stuck in thinking God must answer a prayer a certain way. Oh, how easy it is to forget who we're talking to. <laughs> the father gets a reminder in verse 50. Jesus said to him, Go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. Jesus' words here are a brief command with an explanation. Go home, Jesus says. And I think the man's faith was tested when he turned around and headed home. He had to believe. He had to believe Jesus had already healed his son without seeing it. It was a brave faith because it obeyed solely on the strength of God's word. Yet, happily, this man was strong enough in his faith to turn around and just go home. And that's when he saw the miracle. Isn't it hard to do nothing? So many times we worry because we think, 
that at least it gives us a chance to do something. <laughs> and yet Jesus tells us that worry can't turn one hair on our head white or black. We, we worry and we fret because we think it's better than doing nothing. It, it gives us some sort of feeling of control. Yet faith is strong enough to do nothing. To do nothing but obey when it can't see. To trust when it can't confirm. And so Paul says that the kind of love that comes from God can, feed, <clears throat> can bear all things believe all things, hope all things, and endure all things. In the same way, perhaps you are in the middle of the story. You can't see the upshot, the end, or the moral. But Jesus calls you to trust him this hour. The boy's father obeyed, and he got a surprise on his journey home. Verse 51, as he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better, and they said to him, Yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. Oh, man, how good must that guy have felt to hear that his son was better. Maybe goosebumps covered his arms as he asked, What time did he get better? Knowing what the answer would be before he heard it. You see, the father is not surprised to hear his boy is better. At least that's not what I get in this story. His attention focuses on seeing now how his faith was true. Jesus told him that his boy would be better. And so now he sees how it all fit together. How exciting. What an amazing thing to share when he got home. And yet the ripeness of the moment was harvested when he turned around. Resting on God alone, taking Jesus at his word. You see, God sometimes does not hurry us through those moments where our faith is nourishing itself upon him. God may isolate our faith from our sight like a muscle so that our faith may be strengthened. And, sight is and yet when our prayers are answered and sight is restored, then faith can still grow. Yet faith is what allows us to truly see. C.S. Lewis talks about how the only person he knew uh, who had ever seen a ghost was someone who didn't believe in ghosts. <laughs> in the same way, there were lots of people who didn't believe in Jesus before they saw miracles and didn't believe in him after they saw the miracles. And so it's faith that allows us, after having seen his power, to actually still see that it wasn't just a coincidence. It wasn't just, you know, oh, well, that worked out. We don't know why. <laughs> it's faith that allows us to hold on to that miracle and remember it so that our faith can continue to grow and nourish itself. It was so for this man. Verse 53, the father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed and all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. Faith told him this was no coincidence, no lucky guess. Faith compelled greater faith upon sight and the sharing of the good news of his great joy. And so when he got home and he told people what had happened, this inspired faith in other people. And they hadn't even seen Jesus tell him this they had just heard the story, and yet they believed, and they knew. So before us all stretches a new year. We may think that we are neatly boxed in by life, and maybe that God is even boxed in with us. But ho hopefully as we walk out of here today, and we walk out into this, this beautiful winter scene, we know that we are not boxed in. We know that we are led forward by a God who can do all things well. We may be nowhere near the end, be even closer to the beginning than we thought. But if true faith glows in our hearts, 
then we are blessed no matter what obstacles may haunt the horizon. For we can reassure our hearts. Now, many of you uh, have heard the good news and one of the... uh, one of the things that's so exciting about Christmas is that it is kind of the beginning of what, uh, of how God would share the good news of his son in the world. And as we move forward in the calendar, we get around to March and April, May, we get to focus more on uh, the, the fullness of the story that God sent his son um, the fullness of God and the fullness of man so that, that, that this son, Jesus, could die on a cross and pay for our sins and make it possible so that we can have grace, we can come before God in time of need and experience his favor. No matter where you are today, I pray that that good news would reassure you that God loves you that God has grace for you in time of need. That it's not about what you've done or haven't done. It's about the fact that God loves to be gracious and loves to give grace to you when we call on his son's name. That God wants to give us eternal life. He wants to forgive us our sins. He wants to give us the hope uh, that we can have in an everlasting God. And so, if God is touching your heart with that good news today, I, I pray that you will talk with Pastor Chris, that you will ask somebody sitting next to you, tell me more about Jesus. Tell me more about this man who can heal, this man who can um, lay his life down and take it up again, this man who can forgive my sins. Uh, believe in him and you will have everlasting joy. So we can reassure our hearts with these words. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If your eyes are weary, let them rest. And let faith awake. If you can see Jesus... You can see enough. Uh, Please bow your heads with me.